Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining me tonight. Lions, nature as teacher and healer, embracing wholeness, calling counsel, reclaiming our ancient selves, and personal totem pole medicine. That's what we're going to be talking tonight with my guest, Katrina Clay, who joins me. She's a local woman. She's here in my area, upstate New York, Albany, and she is a self-professed perpetual student of the world. She is a lover of animals, nature, and music, and she sees all guides for healing an authentic, symbolic life. She is a powerhouse. She founded the regional wellness publication here in the northeastern United States called the Healing Springs Journal, which started in 2002 and is now Upstate New York's original resource for healing. And she is also publisher and director of SIPIN, Saratoga Integrative Practitioners Network. And she has a wide range of knowledge on healing modalities and a vast network of expert colleagues. Well, that sounds great. But one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to Katrina was she worked with John Perkins back in 2004. And she has taught a variety of workshops of her own creation that stem from John's modern shamanic work. Now, some of you might remember that I have been on the air with John Perkins, and we had a phenomenal show years ago, and his work is one of my favorites, and I talk a lot about his stuff. So it's going to be fun tonight. We're going to have a great conversation. Pull up a chair, have a seat, get comfortable. We're going to be talking about a lot of really great stuff, and I'm really excited to share Katrina's wisdom with all of you. She has a phenomenal story, and she's a very wonderful writer, and we're going to be dedicated the show tonight to a very special person, but I'm going to let her tell that story. Welcome, Katrina. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Hillary. Um, before we get too far in, I want to say that I decided I'd, re- I'd prefer to sit outside, so if the breeze or anything makes it too, um, um, it, too loud, just let me know and I'll go sit inside. Well, maybe we can see the wind as an elemental spirit guide, and you can lead us through maybe perhaps some messages that are coming through. Good for you, because I have my windows open, and if you guys hear a lot of noise on my end, too bad. It's hot, humid, and stuffy here in upstate New York, and I need a breeze. (laughs) Yes, I agree. (laughs) Wow. Wow. So, okay. I know who you are. My listeners may not. So, you know, where do we start? Now, you have this phenomenal record. Uh, You've done a lot of really great uh, outreach work through your work here in the Albany area with your with your uh, journal and your magazine and your leadership. But you've also you have this really interesting thing here on your bio about these lions and this phenomenal picture of you walking through uh, the the what is that? Africa? Is it Africa that you were in Zimbabwe? Zimbabwe, right. Um, and I said, was... well, I said when I saw this picture, I go, I must talk to her. And how come I haven't talked to her before? She lives less than a half an hour away from me. What is going on? We must have a conversation. So please share your story. This is great. Awesome. Well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the, um, the conversation we will be having tonight. Um, so... I'm thinking you're asking about my trip to Zimbabwe first. Yeah, let's start and, there. Yeah. yeah, that sounds like a good place to start. Everyone always likes hearing about the lions. So um, I have always wanted to go to Africa, primarily because of, you know, their animals um, more than any other reason, although the land itself also kind of speaks to me, but... Truthfully, it's just always been the animals that call to me. And um, it, I had done some research and found this program that is trying to. I'm not sure if you're aware of the situation for lions. Their population, like so many others actually, are decreasing rapidly. Um, we've lost about 90% of the lion population over the last 40 years. You know, it's hard to it's hard to count wild lions numbers exactly because they're slightly elusive. But that's the, a pretty educated guess. And um, so this program is trying something. I'm not, you know, it might not be perfect, but they are trying something where they have taken captive lions and are breeding the captive lions with the. Um, hope to, not hope, the future plan of releasing the babies 
back out into the wild. Hmm. So not the lions that will spend time with humans, but the ones that are babies beyond them. So this program um, needs a lot of help, of course. And so I found it, actually, because I was interested in horses over there. I just Googled horses volunteering lot in Africa, not thinking about lions, but... Um, This came up because they have lions on the property. I mean, they have horses on the property as well uh, to use to um, scan the edges to make sure poachers haven't uh, set up camp or put um, snares out. Um, And so it, it was an amazing experience. The lions are an incredible species. They are very social, much more so. They're, you know, they're a cat that live in groups as opposed to a lot of other cats who are kind of off on their own. So they're very social, and family is really important to them. Mm. As is leisure. They like to hang out and just, like, they're very, you know, you might call lazy, Um, which... I don't know. That kind of surprised me. I don't know what I was expecting, but they're they're just lovely, lovely animals. And um, lazy until and, they're hunting, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, right, and and even then, it just fascinates me the whole. Um, well, I actually did see some of the cats that I worked with try to hunt because they have game all over. And they were really too young at that point to catch anything, but they were working on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting to watch, you know, prey animals are not really that scared of predators. They have the ability to know when one is hungry and when they're not hungry. Now, and, it, I find it interesting, the timing that you went, Katrina, what you were working in the shamanic world, you were you know, learning the shamanic, you know, just to become a shamanic practitioner and uh, the shamanic way of life. And uh, so when you went over to work with the lions, you had already graduated from John's program, correct? Correct. By by probably, well, I guess, I guess not that many years. I was thinking it was 10 years, but it was probably more like five or six years by that time. And, yes, this experience with the lions was less shamanic than I would have particularly hoped for. You know, being around all those animals and getting, um, you know, to pet them even, you know, and walk with them, that was my favorite when we just walked together. There was also a lot more people around than I'm used to. Hmm. Um, You know, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I was in my shamanic realm every once in a while but it was really more of an earth-based experience yeah and you know it it's also what i want to say before we move on is it's really sad however great my experience was and i'm so thankful to have spent time with the lions it's really um a sad moment in the history of our world that we even have to have such a program you know that the lion population is decreasing that fast, and and um, so shame on a, us, shame on humanity for not taking it, better care of these exactly. animals. Exactly, and it's not even that we have to take care. You know, the world is self-sufficient. We're just one part of it, but we, um, you know, they could live without us, but they also need the room to do so and the freedom from our our. our interventions. Did you have any moments when you were over there with the lions that felt like a a medicine journey or, you know, moving into the shamanic thing before? Well, actually, let me, let me backtrack before I ask you that, um, you know, we're talking about shamanic medicine. We're talking about shamanism. Now you're a white woman. I'm a white woman. I've studied shamanism. You've studied shamanism. I have to ask you this because it's been coming up on, you know, in my world over here, and and I've been having conversations about this topic with people. Do you feel that being a white woman, having studied shamanism, that there is kind of this 
odd thing that happens where, you know, if you're not an indigenous person or you don't have brown skin, you're not quite, you know, really ever accepted into the shamanic teachings? Or was it different for you because you worked with John? Uh, I'm curious about how it was for you because I've been on both sides. I've worked with Native Americans. I've worked with quasi Native Americans. I've worked with white, you know, white people who study shamanism. So I'm curious what your uh, experience was moving through that subject matter as a white woman. Right. I um, I probably am a little aware of that more so myself than I felt like it was from the outside, probably in part because John was, you know, a white man. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I I had that, him as one of my main teachers, but, um, you know, in times past, we didn't self-assign ourselves as shamans and go to school for it. You know, the community decided who was um, right for that job. So so for me, it's not really about being white as mm-hmm. much as it is about um, being called, not just from your inner calling, but called also from, um, you know, others. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> of course. Yeah, I don't know. If <laughs> it might not make sense to other people, but that's okay. Right. That's, 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 right. that's what you get. Well, uh, you know, I know that you come to a point in your path where, you know, you're studying with other people and, you you know, you, you start teaching other people's teachings and tools and stuff. And then you get most, most people eventually get to a point where they've been a student for so long that they start to kind of develop their own, their own way of being in the world and, and moving out that work. And you spend a lot of time in nature and you, you're, you talk a lot about that and you share that and you're give people a very beautifully written insight into these mystical experiences that you have i've read through a couple of your articles and they're they're very very well written so has nature kind of morphed into being your teacher whereas maybe john was in the past and others and you've kind of yeah. gone to the the apprenticeship of the earthen world yes i would very much agree with that and part of it is because of my personality because i and and this is going to sound probably contrary for some listeners but my personality really wanted a teacher i wanted somebody that i could just hand over all of my responsibility to i wouldn't have to actually um learn stuff on my own i wanted to somebody to tell me how to do things and and to be honest i was kind of frustrated because then i i would receive teachers or, or or learn from teachers and it never felt like my own learning. It felt like, you know, exactly what it was, somebody sharing their knowledge. But I have to own all that. So for me, it was easier to not learn. I mean, I learned from people. We all learn from everybody. But it was I was better at learning true knowledge when I released the idea that I needed to learn it from another person because then I was able to learn it from my inner knowing that we all do have access to. Some might have a, a, a broader or easier door to walk into that knowledge. Um, Sometimes it's not such an easy path to get to that no. door. I mean, really, we, we fall down and we bump our knees and we bang our heads and we have the rug pulled out from under our feet and we fall down a flight of stairs. And it's, it's not always unicorns and daisies. I mean, sometimes these initiations and these the ways that we come about these aha revelations and, and what we feel inside really is not always such a beautiful, light-glowing journey. It's, it's deep, dark work sometimes. Yeah, did, you find exactly. that, did you find that in your own path? I, yes, for sure. It's especially because I I was born, you know, a white middle class American girl, and and I shouldn't even say that. I don't know if that's why, but it, it easily could be what set me up for doubting myself. And you know, as a kid, anytime I 
said something unusual. I'd get, you know, laughed. La- laugh, that's not the right word. They were all, like, my family was laughing with me, sort of. You know, like, they thought it was cute, but um, not so much something to really pay attention to or, or listen to, you know. So, so I started, I learned early to that doubt part. So to then learn, relearn again and actually trust your own learning from, say, nature or the animals is very challenging because you have to, it's like contrary to everything that you've been told in the beginning of this particular life. I mean, you know, I I think a lot of my knowledge doesn't come from this life, so it doesn't matter what I, what I was born with. Where, did, where does born it come from? Here. Where, where, where do you feel it comes from? From lifetimes of being in, um, in you know, various lifetimes. It doesn't even have to be what they are, what they are exactly, but um, you know, situations that are, or or life life situations that are. Um, just very different from white middle class that we have today. You know, yeah. we're, I mean, th- we're new. This is this is a new experience. This um, you know American lifestyle we have today. It's a very damaging lifestyle. I'm, I'm going to say it because yeah, we really we really don't take accountability the way we should. And a perfect example of that right now is what's happening in Florida in the beaches with the toxic algae blooms and the choking off of the manatees, we have a real issue happening in Florida down there with some very serious water issues. And water issues are starting to show up everywhere. I just was reading an article about the Olympics coming up in Rio. They have discovered superbug viruses in the ocean from the, you know, the way that they have lacked taking responsibility and accountability for cleaning up the shit. Right, yeah. right. You know, I I often say that humans are kind of like we're in the teenage years, and actually, I don't know if it's all humans. At least Americans, <laughs> we're in our teenage years. Like we think we know everything. We don't need our mother anymore. We're, you know, discounting the wisdom of those who came before us because we think we know everything. Well, teenagers do have that moment of pull away. Their brains are actually changing because of puberty and chemicals all rolling around in their hormones. And it's a real, it's a real fact of life. Well, metaphorically, we can, we really can look at the American culture as being a bunch of teenagers, a bunch of, you know, people who run around thinking they know everything and, and not really taking responsibility for their actions, not cleaning up their space well enough. And you look around, that's really what we have. Now, when you work with John, I know John's work very well. When, you know, he was writing, uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, he had talked a lot about his experiences going into third world countries and setting up this big cell of infrastructure so they would join the banking system and owe lots of money and then default on their loans and then we'd all take over their land and all this stuff. And he had this big awakening, you know, where he realized at a conscious soul level he was really going against his heart and against his humanity and it was very difficult for him. Um, now, I'm curious what drew you to his work, and then if you found the same kind of situation maybe happening in your life where you had a moment where you looked at a system and said, no, this isn't right, something needs to change. Did you have that kind of moment in your life that made you go out into the world and create all these beautiful things? I never had any one such moment, but I think many little ones that added up, you know, um, what drew me to John's work was the word shape-shifting. <laughs> I had, right before I saw it in, you know, somewhere his work, I um, had had a past life regression, or at least a regression, where all oh, that's what I was doing was just shape-shifting, shape-shifting, shape-shifting from, from bird to, and truthfully, I don't even it's been a long time, at least 10, 10 years, no, probably more like 12 or 12 or 13 years, so um, I, I might have the details incorrect, but not by far. So in this memory, I was 
shape shifting from an eagle to a land animal, you know, and I just kept shifting, kept shifting, kept shifting. And within, like, within 24 hours, I heard of John Perkins doing this shamanic or uh, shape shifting practitioner certification. And I could not go that year for some reason. I think we were going to be out of town or I had family obligations. And so then the next year it came up, and I knew it was still one of those things that kept niggling at me. Is that the word? I'm not sure. But, you know, I kept niggling <laughs> at this, at this, and I felt the need to um, really listen to it that time. So, so well, thank you for following through, for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and you know, like I said earlier, um, I've never really even taught what John teaches. I've used what he taught in my own way. And, um, again, I kind of wish I could just follow some prescription, but it never felt real to me. And well, because you're supposed to have your own. I, I, I think that's what happens. You know, people fall into these, you know, pools of you know, places and they sit and soak for a while and then they either stay there and get pruned up or they get out and they go off on their own exactly. and they take the information and they weave it into something that's useful and, and evolving of the material. I mean, that's really beautiful, actually. I, I, I think I give you a lot of credit because I myself found myself doing that in my own path. You know, I've, I've worked with teachers in my past and, you know, all great stuff, good teachings, good work. But at the end of the day, you really have to take it and go do something with it yourself. Otherwise, you're just a walking advertisement for your teacher and you're sending everybody off to them and you make no money and you can't support yourself and it becomes a situation. If you're going to be a healer and you're going to teach and you're going to uh, offer beautiful things in the world, you need to be compensated for that and you need to you know, leave a legacy for your family. And speaking of your family, I would love to talk about your grandmother and share. She passed recently on the solstice full moon. Um, and she was a radio host. Tell us about her. Let's, let's give her some love and light on the radio waves. Yeah, I'm sure she would love it, especially since we're two women and her radio program was a women's show. Um, and you know, she just loved, um, she just loved people, to be honest. That's what, probably what it boils down to. She loved people, and people loved her, and she was good at asking questions and getting to the to the root of things. Um, and thank you for bringing her into the conversation. She was a beautiful woman who was not only talented, but she's also, um, you know, she gave me a lot of gifts, passed on a lot of gifts, that I inherited from her, but, you know, she also doubted a lot, but it never stopped her from from doing things, such as having a radio show in the, you know, when was it, the 50s? In the 50s. Three kids at home. In the 50s. I mean, this is, I mean, guys, this is something that's kind of, wow, this is a wow factor, because in the 1950s, most women weren't sitting on the radio talking a woman's radio show. She sounds like a pioneer, iconic woman, and I would have been honored to meet her. So we're going to give her some love. And, and now she was in Sarasota, Florida, from what I understand, half the year. She, now did, what did she think of the oceans and the land down there? Well, she, she loved it. But she was probably there more for the arts. Like for her, she and I differ in that she doesn't, she loves the outdoors and whatnot, but it's not her place. Like cocktail parties and and social gatherings are much more her place. And so I think that's probably why she chose Sarasota um, more so than, than the beaches, um, which she also loved. But. <laughs> I bet she wouldn't be very happy right now with what's going on down there with the water. I'm sure if she had her radio show still going, she would use that as a way to talk about that because, you know, that's really what we have to do now is we have to come up with ways to funnel and channel information to, you know, other people 
And thankfully, right. we had the internet to do that. She didn't have the internet to do that. She she didn't have. She just had terrestrial radio, really. You know, very right. very limited technology back then. And uh, you know, now we have an opportunity to share all these things and get information out, and and people can have a better idea of what's going on in the world. Um, you know, and it kind of comes to a nice roundabout way of talking about the next subject, which is embracing wholeness and just kind of coming back. You know, from this splintered place. And you offer a talk on this, actually. You, you can actually be, you know, speak on this to a, you know, a group of people if someone was interested. Yeah, you know, how today's man-made world has splintered humans from their wholeness. Talk a little bit about that. Well, um, you know, it's not just the modern world who, that has kind of done it. Even our spiritual communities do it to some extent. Um, but wholeness really is about embodying the whole of of our humanness, which includes, you know, all facets, which some are dark, um, you know, like our shadow sides, um, but whole, that is part of the whole. And we have a tendency in this part, this is like the positive side of, of modern society, of, of wanting to always be improving ourselves, and and we forget to look at um actually accepting our wholeness first. And then, you, of course, you always need or will want to um, continually improve, but you can't do that without first um, going in and recognizing our being as a whole, such as, um, you know, we have spirit, we have soul. And actually, we don't have these things. They're all a part of that wholeness that I'm referring to. So um, I feel like I just got a little bit lost in that. But modern, okay, modern society, how that takes, splinters us is, um, you know, giving us that path that we all think we're supposed to take and be good in school, for instance, which I wasn't that good at. I didn't really like school. And um, as it turns out, I just found some, some standardized test results from, you know, 7th or ninth grade, something like that, and and I wasn't even that bad. I was actually kind of a smart kid, or as above average in some things, I should say, but I didn't do, my grades didn't reflect that because school was not made, um, it's not made for the wholeness of human beings. It's made for one certain type, in my opinion. I think Montessori method is a good alternative. I think they're they're coming up with we're going to have to come up with yeah. a different way of education because education right now needs a massive reform. It needs a massive overhaul. It, it's just so wrong for a sustainable consciousness in a sustainable world. I mean, we're creating little mini competitors who go out and become you know fantastic consumers, and they go out and they do yeah. the game really well, and they don't necessarily redefine it. But the ones who who do are the ones like you who have gone in, seen it, don't really want it, reject the game as it is, and then you come out on the other side, someone who's reshaping it or redefining it. And I think you do that very well in your work. I mean, you you have proven that with your successful magazine. You have proven that with pulling practitioners together with the Sippin Network. And, uh, you know, you offer all these different, unique, original offerings to people and and so someone could look up to you and say wow how does she do that how does she get out of the constructed mind frame that we're all kind of pushed into through indoctrination and say well i want to do something unique and original that's going to free people instead of just stick them in a box take their money and then go off and (laughs) say next right right Uh, it's so and i'm not sure you're actually asking me to answer that but all I want to say is anyone who is wanting to do it, just be prepared that it is challenging. And all it really, all the challenges are because we are, you're letting go of that indoctrinated, what, indoctr, I don't know what that word okay. is. But, you don't have to say it ten times fast while chewing gum. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that is the tough part. It's not actually the work or the, the end result or it's, there's no end result. It's just, you know, it's, it's not. It's, it's really, it's really an ever-growing, blooming thing. Yeah. 
It's a cycle. I mean, everything you know, because you spend a lot of time in nature. Nature doesn't have a constant. It's always changing, whether it's in seasons or temperature or whatever. You always have an element of change. A flower doesn't just stay bloomed. You know, it goes through a wilting cycle and goes back into the earth. And we have, we've come to this strange place in humanity where, you know, we have such a linear perspective of life that we forget the circular and we forget, we forget the all encompassing. We forget that everything that touches me in the ethers is connected to everything else. And we spend so much time. I'm going to get on a little rant here, probably. Sorry. I'm going to probably agree with it. So go. (laughs) I mean, if you don't agree with it, it's okay. You know, it's kind of one of these things where I just think that people have so much more potential than what they, what they do. I mean, they spend so much time in the self-talk that keeps them depressed and keeps their light kind of dimmed for whatever reason. And if if they just got out of that and and really worked through it and, and did what they had to do and said, well, gee, that thought really makes me feel depressed. Okay, well, let's change the thought. And they change the thought, and they go off and have a great day. I mean, if our thoughts are so powerful and they can change how we feel so dramatically, imagine what they're doing to our environment on a collective scale. And when you think about what's going on in the world, what we, what, well, what we're subjected to on, you know, certain, uh, you know, TV and other things and online, we see these constant barrage of headlines and things going on and nasty, gross things. And you have to wonder, you know, physics gives us things like the butterfly effect. It gives us things like, well, you know, whatever you think over here might affect over there, spooky action at a distance or something scientific that really explains these odd quantum nuances. But if we really just break it down to, to simple shop talk, we can say, hey, you're having all this negative self-talk today. You're probably affecting something somewhere. So maybe you might want to make sure that you can't think a little differently or maybe take a look at some of these frustrations and, and deal with them. We're not giving people the skill set to deal with their, their issues. And so it's a redefinition and, you know, people like you who come in and teach these things and go on and talk about them and come on shows like this and talk about it, get that kind of, I don't know, alpha state, if you will, where the conversation's a little more up here and it's not so damaging and negative and, you know, because I really could do a radio show and just go on and and whine and complain about everything, right? I mean, I could be on the air for 10 years whining and complaining, but I'm not. I'm on the air talking to people like you and having conversations that offer some different perspective. And I really think, I really think that's the answer is having conversations where it's dialogue, not just somebody, one person talking endlessly and not giving any room for exchange, but a conversation, a dialogue. How do you see dialogue as a shamanic tool? Well, funny you should actually use that word. I, my way of working with shamanism mod and i call it modern shamanism is i do not journey for anyone else i lead journeys for people to go on their own and in part because we are needing to take responsibility for some things and and the conversation idea is awesome hillary but action is also really something we're missing right now you know um easy to just say we want to help things but then use plastic bags every single day but going back to dialogue i um so very often in my shamanic journeys which for those who don't know what it would be like i drum a very steady beat and then do something sort of like a guided meditation over it and or simultaneously with this very steady rhythm on the drum. And um, often what I do is have the, the participant um, meet somebody. Usually it is a, a, a facet of themselves, such as their ancient soul or their ancient self. And, and then they dialogue, you know, and one of that calling counsel workshop that I, is a six-week workshop where we we um, 
every week we do a different journey, one to our bodies in dialogue with our bodies, one to our soul in dialogue with our soul, and one with our guide in dialogue. And in the end, the sixth week, we do calling, we call counsel and dialogue with the various facets of ourselves because going back to wholeness we do have all these variety of facets but but they all work as a whole just as the earth has all these different facets like a tree is not the same thing as a grass but they both serve their own purpose just as our ego actually does have a purpose in its to interface with the world and our soul has its own purpose and to have all of those pieces working towards the same goal or in, it's not a goal, isn't the word I want to use, but working in, you know, in cooperation with each other is what creates unity as one whole being. As well, I think it leads you to understand that you're experiencing life as an individual at the same time as being one facet of the collective. And I hope that really sinks in, guys. If you're listening in that and you just heard what she said, I, I hope that's sinking in because it's really what's going to change the world. It, it's really what's going to help heal some of the things that we have going on in this planet today that are anti-life, anti-love, anti-connection, anti-cooperation, just complete, uh, what do you call that, wrenches thrown into the cog kind of thing. These are things that we don't have to choose you know, we can choose other things. Now, you're coming to Albany. You're coming to Soul Space down in Albany on July 16th, uh, 1 to 4 p.m. If anybody is interested and in the area and would like to come listen to Katrina teach us a workshop on the reclaiming of our ancient selves, you can go to inspiresoulspace.com, find the event page, and register. It's going to be a phenomenal, uh, wonderful time, and I'm looking forward to it. It. And some of the things that we've been talking about so far this hour are going to be incorporated into uh, the event, and it's going to be a wonderful, fabulous time. I'm greatly looking forward to it. I'll give you more information on that at the end of the show. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. You know, reclaiming our ancient selves. What exactly does that mean? All right. So I. I came up with that. I don't even know, actually. I shouldn't say it. I probably am giving you too much information. Like, these are the kinds of things I do. I always make myself <laughs> seem less, you know, knowledgeable by the way I tell things. And it's only because it's the way it really happens, where some some teachers don't tell you everything, and they just tell you what their, their knowledge is. But point being, I came up with that and thought I was being so smart, and um, and then I did, because I was asked to give a presentation, and it was just for that one presentation. However, once I actually went deeper into it, it's kind of grown um, to be really more important to me than I anticipated it to be at that time. So, um, but there is that part of us, and I think if you all just get quiet, and feel inside of yourself, there's this part of each one of us that is still connected to ancient times before all this modern, um, you know, culture. And, and being able to access that part of ourselves, which has kind of gone dormant, you know, um, I mean, Regardless of the fact we get to go to the grocery store instead of um, hunting and gathering, our systems are still wired for hunting and gathering. So now it's just used differently. So now, in, so for hunting, that would be like a seeking, seeking for food. So we always are searching. So now we search for information or we search for the right car or we search, you know, um, for various things, it, it's 
to be honest, right at this moment, I'm seeing how modern day society is doing exactly um, what it is meant to do. It's just focused on the on different things from what nature and natural um, is na- natural to us, which again would be searching for food and searching for shelter. Now we're searching for um, the right pocketbook or you know whatever it is. doesn't really matter. But those those very um, it's a hunting. It's a hunting. Exactly. Whatever it is, we're hunting. We're hunting something. So do you feel that we've lost the instinctual fear and replaced it with a psychological fear? Um, yeah, that would probably be a good way of saying it. One of the other things I think that's happening, though, is because we're not doing, you know, we're wired for short periods of stress. So, like, if a lion was chasing you, you'd be scared. You'd either freeze and get picked up, or you'd save yourself, find shelter where it can't reach you, and settle in, and your and your stress would go back down. What's happening in today's modern society is we're finding things stressful and carrying them with us for all day long, all night long, and we never actually let that stress down. Um, and so... Are we replacing the natural instinctual fear? I'm, I think we are not really replacing it. It's almost exactly just following us all the time instead of ever dissipating. Do you think it's like a little tug on your shoulder, like, hey, 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 remember me? <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, 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 you do get you do get afraid for a reason sometimes, and sometimes that reason is good. Sometimes yeah. when you're threatened, you yeah. know when you're it's we're not really threatened. We, we, I mean, we're kind of we're kind of complacent a complacent species. Can I even say that? Because I think it's true. In many ways, we've become very complacent. We're not hunted by anything technically, maybe each yeah. other. Maybe each other, but I mean, yeah. it's more of like a, you know, until you're in a situation where your life is literally threatened, you don't really ever respond from an instinctual fear. You respond from a psychological fear. It's like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? I'm worried, stressed. You know, you're going to yeah. lose your job. Is your partner going to leave you? Is your, are your kids going to be okay? I mean, we have these kind of, these are real life things, but it's more of a psychological fear than it is an instinctual fear. An instinctual fear might be when you're walking down the woods, you know, in a pad, a path and a, a bear comes out and starts chasing you. I think you would really know the difference between instinctual fear at that ro- at that moment <laughs> than right. maybe anything else. And and that's kind of what I'm referring to. We're not really put into nature to really interact with some of these life-death situations. And we've kind of lost and become very, oh, what's the right word? I don't know. I, I guess complacent in, in a violent nature. We see violent video games. We see violence in movies. We've become very numb. And when we see awful stories in the headlines about violent acts and stuff, you know, we go post about it on Facebook or we talk about it to a neighbor and we go grocery shopping and worry about what's for dinner and what time we're supposed to pick the kids up. It's kind of like we've become really a strange species. I don't know. What do you think? I agree. Just completely out of it over here, my crazy little world. <laughs> no, I I agree with you. I see it that way and um So what do we do? Know, what do we that's do? part I'm not sure of and so I have a hard time with that cuz um I want to have a solution if I'm going to make a a complaint that's it's not a complaint but a, a, you know I want to have some kind of answer I guess but um you know what's funny funny is that in modern days people or, or at least here in America I'm sure other cultures maybe not as much but um we think of the wild and and animals that live out there as as scary and dangerous like you know they kill wolves because they're dangerous um, and meanwhile, all the animals actually have a system that they work together. It doesn't matter even which species they are, but the birds will tell you if somebody is coming, like a fox. You know, now the fox isn't always 
visible, so it's not, you know, it, it still has its ability to sneak up and do its game, but it's all, it's circular within those species, not just because one is predator, one is prey, but also they know ahead of time. Well, maybe not ahead of time, That's, but I'm getting lost in, in the circular thought thinking for myself right now but um the it's very is, interesting to listen to by the way <laughs> okay good the point is <laughs> that that it's it's actually a lot more cooperative out into in the woods than in american culture the you know even the trees help each other out not just only one species all of those root systems are helping each other out yeah. Now, does that mean every one of them lives and thrives on that? No, it still doesn't doesn't mean that. But they work for each other. Well, like you that. know, I read something recently where they talked about when a tree dies, uh, mm-hmm. there's a sugar compound that actually continues to be produced within the roots of that dead tree that will actually feed the life around it for as long as it's doing that. And right. so it, it kind of, you know, when I when I go out to nature, I do nature photography, as you know, and some things, and, and I'm a lot like you. I go out and meditate in nature, and it's really changed the way I see things. Um, and so when you see something like that, just, you know, selflessly just giving to the to the to the environment and making sure that it's nurtured it's a family it's almost like a family feel to it like it's a family of trees it's not just a grove of trees it's a family of trees um last year i went to uh, pando forest in utah which is the largest living aspen outcrop on the planet and it's about a hundred a hundred miles a hundred acres big something like that and and it's just this phenomenal aspen out like so you get out and you walk in any part of this forest and you can just feel uh, there's a there's a strange feeling that you once you tap into you can find it in any any kind of tree space any kind of forest there's there's a there's an electrical life force that lives in nature that oftentimes we don't even spend enough time out in to even know it exists but when you do and you start doing it and you start to realize that there is an energy that you can tap into every day that's out of your office out of your home off the computer off your cell phone that will enrich your biosystem the same kind of way because if if nature is showing you that it's taking care of everything around it and you go into it you're around it it's not going to reject you it's right. going to accept you into that environment. So, I mean, that said, do you feel that that's kind of a metaphor for how we we can heal and change the way we're doing things? Is this unconditional acceptance and I don't know, be yeah. like a tree, be like a tree? Right. I I do think that um, one of the reasons I like teaching connection to nature and. Um, I I don't know if I teach it. I am constantly trying to um, encourage and inspire those around me to do so, spend more time outside. One of the, um, well, first of all, I did want to say that your immune system actually does increase, is higher the the more time you spend with trees. Um, But one of the reasons it's most important to me is that one of modern day society most people don't feel like they belong anywhere and well, yeah. Yeah. yeah you know as soon as you feel that connection you know you do belong here you're just as much a part of this this earth we're all just part of the earth however we're not like you know i'm as equal to a tree as and a rock to- and around. I mean, that is shamanic teaching. Shamanic teaching is about finding this connection, this higher consciousness connection. Call it whatever you want. You can come from it from whatever protocol you've been cha- you've been trained and right. taught. And what it really comes down to is your as a single person's relationship with nature. Now, if you walk it, now a lot of people are afraid of nature. Be they, they're afraid of ticks, they're afraid of snakes, yeah. they're afraid of, you know, you can't walk near a field without hearing someone scream, eh, you know, because the bug's coming their way. But I think once you get over that initial fear, 
you move into something that's a whole lot different. And I actually think nature actually responds to you in an intelligent, conscious way. If you sit down, now you have a horse and you use your horse in some of your, your teachings and, and your interactions with people who come and work with you. I am sure that you have seen plenty of times people kind of come to a realization that there's a consciousness in the animal. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Um, and how is that my, for you as a teacher to see that transpire? Yeah, sometimes I actually, I, mean, I usually am doing it myself at the same time, so I'm kind of not aware until we all come back afterwards and talk about our, their everyone's experiences. Um, but one of the, you know, I, my horse is is a teacher sometimes, but I actually really like being in larger groups of horses. And he I, he does have his own little group, but um, the more the larger the group, the more profound of an understanding it is to um, sense that belonging that they have as herd animals. You know, it, it's not based on. This is something that happens a lot in modern days. We want to be with people that we have those same opinions of, you know. And, and of course, these, that is more pleasant. But this, this sense of unconditional belonging has to be bigger than that. We have to include everybody and, and know that we all belong. Now, that's especially hard when there's so much corruption and... and um, yeah, trickery. There's trickery. trickery yes. Trina. I, I know. It is so <laughs> disheartening, but at the same time, we have to recognize that is a part of us and we are a part of it. And um, as sad as that is. But my point, ultimately, going back to the horses, is that, that feeling of being a part of something bigger. The, the horses are herd animals and they belong together. You know, and they, they don't they don't wonder if that person or that other horse likes them because they're, if they're haircut <laughs> or, you know, like if they're carrying the right bag or if they have the right shoes. That They oh, don't know like they belong energy. together. In, don't and that like doesn't We're gonna they all up. like each other. <laughs> <laughs> they don't all like each other. They have their own preferences and they have their own friends, but they still know a sense of belonging that humans are missing right now. Yes, so I agree. being in large groups of horses is especially... Well, it's like, you know, a lot of people who go onto a spiritual path, they find a spiritual family, but they have a lot of real difficulty, you know, being around their biological family. Yeah, and, right. and, you know, I have always said that some of your most challenging healing will be in your biological family, the core relationships, the ones you don't get along with, the ones that are black sheep, the ones you don't talk to because of whatever. I mean, it's kind of like one of those things where whoever is your most challenging person yeah. is ultimately has the potential to be your greatest teacher. And the okay. more we overcome this, this, this separation and discord, you know, we become like a herd of horses where it's commune no matter what. And right. we can all feel that. And we all, you know, we all benefit from that. We all move forward and heal and are stronger because of it. Uh, or, you know, you can have the one horse that walks off and says, you know, screw all of you. I'm going to go sit over here and not going to pay any attention to you. And, you know, it's probably going to get depressed after a while. And then eventually it's going to want the herd back. So it's kind of like, I don't know. We have so much to learn, and so little of it is, you know, complicated. It seems very simple. It's almost like it's so simple, maybe people don't trust it, and that's why. We're actually down to uh, the last few minutes of the show, so I want to give you a chance to let people know where they can find you and where they can find all your great stuff and what else you have going on besides coming to Albany on July 16th. Right. Well, I do have a, a retreat in Costa Rica in late October. October, which I haven't, um, I haven't memorized the website title for that because I wasn't the one who created it. But um, <laughs> you can always find me on Facebook or through the Healing Springs Journal, which that website is thehealingspringsjournal.com, not the, just healingspringsjournal.com. And on that website is a page just about me, and you can always sign up for um, my 
what what you know, email list and from there and uh, my blog's title is a trees voice dot com a trees voice dot com Yes, thank you so much. All of those links are available right here on Achieve Radio's archive and will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, the archive will be published there in a few days and you can share it around with all your friends and talk about all the great things we talked about. Now, I want to just say in closing, uh, thank you for being who you are and for sharing yourself so authentically and for bringing the community together here. You have done a phenomenal job uh, for so many people and you have created a beautiful family here. Well, thank you, Hillary, for all the work you've done in in both radio and outside of it in our community as well. So you've been at it a long time, and I appreciate all your efforts. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting you on the 16th. We're going to have a lot of fun, and I hope everybody comes and joins us. We're out of time. I do. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Until next time, namaste. Namaste.